My name is Michael Oxley. I'm 22 years old and I'm from Reading. Before I share this, I would just like to say that I said to God, when I agreed to do this, I said, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna have to do it honestly. I'm gonna have to share some things which I've never said to anybody. Never, ever, ever told anybody. And it's hard for me. But I'm gonna start with, I was born in, in Wales. Um, had a happy life. Uh, things were good. Moved about a bit, moved uh, to a place called Woodcut and then moved to a place called Tame. When I was in Tame, things were good. Things were very, very good. I have a lot of good memories. Uh, my family were together. Everybody was happy. Um, there were problems, but things were good. Slowly, as my dad went through some personal addictions of his own, my mum began to fall out of love, you know. And I kind of, I don't know, they just separated. My mum left, I remember we jumped on a, on a bus one day and we left. We moved to uh, Oxford before that though, sorry. Um, moved to Oxford and then I didn't like it, didn't like it at all. We were living in a bedsit in a one, two bedroom bed seat. We had two bedrooms, one for me and my brother, brother and sisters, and one for my mum and dad. Um, we eventually got a house, um, but yeah, my mum left my dad. Uh, moved to Reading, and them separating really, really hit me hard. I don't know if my mum ever knows how it hit me, but it hit me hard. Uh, that was when I was eight. When I was nine, I started getting in trouble, you know. I uh, didn't know, my mum was working ridiculous hours. Um, she never really had the time to spend with us. Uh, so I started spending time with people on the street, you know. Uh, spending time with friends, not good people. And when I was nine years old, I started smoking, just through peer pressure. Um, and then, started just getting in trouble, hanging around on the street, uh, I remember, at the age of nine years old, I got arrested. At the age of nine. Something I didn't do, I will say. I didn't actually, I wasn't involved, I was just there, but I got arrested. And I just started causing a lot of trouble. My mum couldn't cope. She just couldn't cope with me. I was uncontrollable. Uh, so she sent me to live with my, my dad in Milton Keynes. Um, while I was there, you know, my dad was still struggling with his own addictions and wasn't really in a stable set of mind. I 
remember, you know, we never really had any money. It was always hard. He was working, I would say, but he had his own addictions. So the money was never there, you know. And because of his addiction, he had a lot of a lot of mental issues. And I remember one day after school, uh, he came home from work and he just, I don't know, he just started to hit me, you know. Um, it carried on for a few months. It was very tough. Got to the point where he... I don't know, I don't think he even showed any emotion towards it anymore. I think it didn't even affect him. He used to do things like, to punish us, we would have to stand up against a wall with our hands like that and stay there the whole day. Um, so it was very torturous. But anyway, uh, one day he came home from work and Somebody at school had said something about that I had bullied them or something, I can't remember what. So he said that he's going to show me what it's like to be bullied. And he started to hit me. When he was hitting me, he was counting how many times he did it. And I remember him counting to 80. So the social services, I went to school the next day and um, I was just like, I don't know, I, 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 was, I remember I was in the PE uh, cloakroom, changing room, and I just called my teacher in and I showed the teacher what he had done. And they phoned social services, uh, got in touch with my mum. My mum came and picked me up and I went back to Reading. Uh, I was still smoking at this time. I was still doing things that I shouldn't be doing. My mum, I don't think ever knew what was going on in my head at that time. I was 11 years old and struggling with that. Like, I was so emotional and she still, she was a single mother of uh, four children. She. She couldn't, she didn't have the time to spend with us. So, I don't know, she just never really noticed how I was feeling. Um, and then, I mean, one day, uh, I had a few friends over and they just started talking about, yeah, let's go and get some hash. Let's go and get some hash. I didn't even know what that was. Didn't have a clue. Um, so, we went and got it and just smoked it in my house, you know, just sat in my house and just smoked it. And then I didn't even enjoy it, to be honest. For me, it was, I didn't like it at all. Uh, but I noticed that it was an escape. I was escaping the feelings and the anger and all the emotions that I was going through, I escaped it. So, me and one of the friends that I was with, we started to use it more and more.
carried on smoking for, I don't know, a few months and then we decided um, to get some cannabis, some actual like cannabis, herbal and from then, wow, I mean, that was my drug of choice, man. I was, that just took me completely away from everything. Smoked it and smoked it and then, I mean, I would spend like every day of the week, I would go and get some weed and bunk off at school with my friend, go get some weed. Uh, we'd go to Asda and we would get a bottle of vodka and we would bunk off of school and we would just get a mash up. For me, I was just so just avoiding life as in like the feelings and emotion and yeah, just I felt like I couldn't really cope with the emotion, so I didn't want to deal with it. It affected me a lot because by the time I did my GCSEs, I mean, I was smoking every day, every single day. And did my GCSEs and didn't, I mean, I finished school, but I didn't get nothing, not a thing from school really. Uh, so when I finished school, I would just spend all day, every day, just sat at home smoking. But during school, I was still, like I said, I, emotionally I wasn't there. So I was causing a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble at home. My mum kicked me out. I went to live with my auntie and uncle. I lived there for about a year, a year and a half, I would say. Uh, and then I went to live with my nan. When I was at my nan's is when things took a real turn for the worst. I started getting involved with, well, I met a friend who, he used to take cocaine, he used to take pills, he used to take all kinds of drugs, all kinds of drugs. And he introduced me to them and I started off we took some cocaine I took some cocaine with him one time I didn't even know what I was doing didn't even know how to do it you know but yeah I continued to take it I built up an addiction to it Now, to fund this addiction, I mean, I was working, but my addiction became, I was taking it every day. So, to fund a habit like that, to spend 40 to 80 pound a day on cocaine, plus smoking weed, I mean, at this time, I was smoking probably 50 pound a day on weed. So, I had to find a way of funding it, so I started to sell weed. There were times where I didn't have no money. An addiction like that I mean, I needed to use every day, or I felt like I needed to use every day. So, 
I mean, I started to steal money. I started to, you know, go into my nan's purse and steal money out of her purse. I didn't want to, really didn't want to. Um, but it wasn't me doing it, it was the addiction. So overpowered. Uh, I got to probably 18, I would say, 19. 18, I reckon. And I decided to stop selling uh, drugs. Completely decided to stop selling them. And it was a great thing. I, I felt so good about doing it, but then at the same time, I still had the addiction. Still, I was battling. How am I gonna fund this addiction? I didn't want to quit. Did not want to quit. So, I started to steal money more, you know. Um, went to my nan's purse. I found not only a bank card, but a pin code as well. So, without thinking, I took it and I went to the cash point and drew out her money. Uh, drew out a ridiculous amount. found out, of course, and kicked me out. So, I went to live with my mum, went back to my mum's. She took me in, you know, she, she said that, you know, I've got to make a lot of changes, but she took me in. I still had the addictions and I mean, I, I was working, so I had money. So, you know, it was going okay. I started, I uh, met a, fr a few friends and I, I was walking, we were walking down the road one time and my friend went into the bookies. And he came out and he said, he asked me if I have two pounds. I gave him that two pound and within literally, what? Two, three minutes, he came out with 36 pound. And from that moment, I I had seen something that I'd never seen before. I had seen an easy way, legitimately, whatever that word is, legitimately, of making money. He made it seem so easy, so, so, so easy. So I started to spend a little few quid here, few quid there, five pound, every now and then, but pretty quick, it became something that I was doing every day, you know? And any gambler will tell you, if they're being honest, you'll never win. I mean, I was spending ridiculous amounts of money a day. I was spending up to 20, 30 pounds a day in the bookies. Um, on the roulette machines in there. Moved on to playing poker. Me and my friends, every night, literally every night. I'm telling you, if I wasn't at work, not even just every night, if I wasn't at work, 
I was playing poker. There's one on Facebook. There's, you know, there's poker websites all over the internet. We would play poker in his house. I was playing poker and I couldn't get enough. We played it all the time. I still, I mean, I started to sell drugs again at that time. And I was taking all kinds of drugs, you know. So not only did I have a gambling addiction, I had drug addictions. I was taking coke, I was taking pills, I was smoking 50 pound of weed a day. I was, uh, I was taking just everything. I mean, I even took what's uh, GHB is what is known as date rape. I even voluntarily took that. And there was a time where I didn't have any money. Did not have any money. And I was on a poker website. I was high, completely out of my face, and you know, didn't learn a lesson. Went back down to my mum's purse and took her bank card again. And you know, I emptied her account. Literally emptied her account. In that one night, emptied her account. Didn't care to me, you know. At that time, I was severely depressed. Severely depressed. I'm not saying this is an excuse, but I didn't care about anybody. Didn't care. I had no care in the world for anything. I didn't care about myself, didn't care about anybody. So, it didn't really phased me too much. It didn't bother to me at all that I just just destroyed my mum. Of course, I mean, when I left my mum, she didn't even know. Went downstairs the next day and I had to face my mum. And that is the hardest thing I ever, ever had to do. The hardest thing. I went down and you know, she, she, I was chatting to her as though it hadn't happened. I remember she bought me a packet of sweets and eating those sweets, I just felt so hurt. Like, I was just running over my head. How could I do this? How could I do this? So, I knew that she was going into town and that she was going to go and check a bank. And I literally, that day, just packed a bag with some clothes and just left. Just left, when I left, she didn't even know that I'd left. I didn't say bye or anything, I just left. And for around a week, I was staying out on the street. I was sleeping outside. And all through this time, every single day, I was in tears, you know? I was just... That is when I felt sorry. I couldn't do it no more. I was just like, I don't know. From that moment, I gave up taking coke. I was still smoking weed and I was still uh, gambling and things, but I stopped to take coke. And after about a week and a half, 
one of my friends, his, uh, his mum let me stay at her house. I was there for about two, three weeks. And I got my own place. When I got my own place, I had nothing. I was so happy, but I had nothing. I was like, right, it's time for me now to make a fresh start. To become who I should be. To become the man that I, I need to make. But while I was there, you know, I still I had no money. So, I, I couldn't afford to get anything. All I had in my little one bedroom shared house was a bed, a chest of drawers, and a sofa. That's all I had. I had nothing. Nothing at all. And I was severely, severely depressed. When I say I was depressed, I mean I was suicidal. Absolutely suicidal. I, I remember I used to walk over, there was a certain bridge. And I used to walk over it almost every day. And there'd be like, there'd be cars coming underneath and I would walk past it, walk over it every day and think is today the day that I jump over that? Is today the day that, you know, I just take that leap? While I was living in that house my sink got, I had a sink in my room and it got blocked. I phoned up my landlord and I said to them, look, the sink's unblocked, can you go in and unblock it? When they went to my room, they saw that I had nothing, I had absolutely nothing. So they assumed that I wasn't really living there. So they put a lock on the door and they said that I'd abandoned the place. So I'm homeless. I went back to my nan's. Now, it's only now that I think about it, now that I know what love is, I think to myself and I think, what love did my nan have? Not once did she let me stay there. And I just, I did everything that I possibly could to, to hurt her. I did one of the worst things you could do to hurt somebody. She let me back. I was staying on the sofa and I was, I was depressed, severely depressed by this time still, severely depressed. I remember I, I still had an addiction to gambling and it was coming up to my birthday. And she got me a laptop. And about, say, four or five weeks after I got the laptop, I started to play poker again. Started to really play a lot of poker.
And you know, I did the same thing again. I don't know why. I mean, Satan was just controlling me. I was just, I was a pawn for Satan to play with. I took a bank card. I went onto the uh, website and I emptied her account, completely emptied her account. <sighs> From there, she found out, obviously. The bank phoned her. She didn't actually find out for a few days and the bank phoned her. And that's where she found out. She kicked me out and I was homeless. I was on the street. For a couple of weeks, I was staying at a friend's house. And while I was there, one of my friends who, who uh, went to visit, he told me that about his mum. He said, she works in a charity shop. She's the manager of a charity shop. And it's a good idea if I go and volunteer. I, I went, I got involved, and I really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. I was working there probably for about three weeks, I would say. And then by this time, my, the person I was staying with, he had asked me to leave. So I had nowhere to go, absolutely nowhere. So I was back on the street. And so after th around three weeks working there, my manager prayed with me. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. And she prayed with me. And when she prayed with me, you know, something happened. I broke down. I was in tears. I... It was just streaming down my face. And something happened inside. I felt something. I took something away from that which I couldn't explain. Could not explain. I had a feeling of just happiness. Happiness. And she left it as that. She just prayed with me and left it. From that day, I mean, for years previous to that, I was on antidepressants. And from that day, I haven't taken an antidepressant. I had a peace inside, which was just amazing. A week later, I took a Bible. I just grabbed a Bible. Nobody offered it to me, nobody said, here, take a Bible. Nobody said I should start reading it or anything. And I just started to read it. Within two hours of reading that Bible, still being on the street, I just went to a park, just sat in a park and just read the Bible. And within two hours, I read the whole of Matthew. Didn't tell no one that I had taken a Bible. Uh, a week after that, my manager, she got hold of me. She phoned me at work and she said, there's a lunch at the church, at the church plant that she goes to. Every, uh, every last Sabbath of the month at that church plant, they had a, um, a lunch and she invited me along. 
And when she invited me, I said to her, I'll come for the service as well. So, you know, I went for the service. And the people there were just so, I don't know, I couldn't explain it at the time. They were just so loving. Something that I'd never ever felt before. They were loving. The Sabbath school, I, I mean, I didn't even know what a Sabbath was didn't have a clue what the word Sabbath meant. And they kind of, I don't know, the, the, the Sabbath school there, they just explained things so well. For me, I didn't even want to take anything really from it, you know, it was more for me, just about life lessons, about learning how to be good. That was something that I'd never known, how to be good. So I continued to go for weeks. I was going, didn't really know what they were talking about a lot of the time, but I was going. And eventually, I was learning more and more. And I was starting to realise things about, about God and about Christ, you know, about, about the love that he has. And I started to feel it more and more inside. I, I started to feel the Holy Spirit, you know. I would say... Four and a half months after I'd first started going to church, I started going to Wednesday night prayer meeting. And at this time, I felt like a Christian. I felt like a Christian. And I was receiving the blessings that God was prepared to give me and I was recognising them. I mean, from the day that I went to church, I don't think I ever spent another night outside. I'm pretty sure I didn't actually spend another night out on the street. There were times where I was desperate for some money, you know. I, there was a time where I had only received half a payment of what I would normally get. And that week, I needed the money. I really, really needed the money. And I had never in my life had a tax rebate, but that one week, that one week, God sent me a taxi bait. And it was just, it was amazing, you know. I, how could it be just coincidence? How could it just, you know, that isn't something that happens. That's not something that happens. It wasn't more than I would usually get either. It wasn't less than I would usually get. It was the exact amount that I would normally receive. So, you know, God doesn't give you what you don't need. So things were happening. Powerful, powerful things. And I was, I was recognising it. I couldn't explain any other way of it happening, you know. Things like that never happened to me before.
A friend asked me a little while after if I wanted to go to a campaign. It started, the day after she asked me is when it started. And I was like, I have no money. And she was like, don't worry, God will provide. It was in a castle uh, in Alton. It was called Alton Castle. And when I went there, I fell in love. I fell in love twice. I fell in love with God and I fell in love with my girlfriend. I found my girlfriend and I fell in love with her. While I was there, I couldn't focus on anything. I, I couldn't focus. I was still smoking, I was still smoking weed. I, I took these things there, you know, to a church event. I took these things. Um, but something happened, you know. I, I couldn't sit down and listen to the message for more than 15 minutes without getting up and leaving. Couldn't do it. And this one time, I got, I, I just, I don't know. I felt God call me. He called me outside and I was walking around the grounds and just for the first time, I was really, really, chatting to him and again I was in floods of tears it's amazing how God does that how, how he could I was a man I don't cry you know and yet he brought me to tears I was just chatting to him and I accepted him from that time as my father I had heard enough things to know and I'd seen the work that he'd done because I had been willing to have him work in my life I heard sorry I um, accepted him as my father I'd never I mean that week that I spent at that at that castle, I've never ever ever been so happy, never been so happy in my life. I went back, went back to Reading after the campaign finished and the first thing I did when I got back was get high. Literally the first thing I did when I got back was smoke a spliff. And while I was there, I made the decision to get baptized. I mean, I knew from the moment that I stepped into a church, I would get baptized. I knew, but I didn't know that I would get baptised, if that makes sense. Inside, something was telling me that one day I'm going to be baptised. I'm going to be a Christian. But I made the decision there to get baptised. Started having some Bible studies and They were one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. And from those moments, from those Bible studies, man, I couldn't deny, could not deny God. I knew 100% that God was real. I knew. In November last year, in 2010, there was at the uh, 
church in Reading, Reading Central Church, there was a campaign. Uh, it was a youth campaign. And a pastor came over from America. And at this campaign, I got baptised. On the 20th of November 2010, praise God, I got baptised. Now there's something powerful to, to my baptism, something really, really powerful. In 2008, this pastor came to Reading. There was a campaign in Reading and somehow God took me to that campaign. You know, I basically, I was with a friend and we were trying to get some money. We wanted to get some drugs. He said his sister might be able to give him some money. So we went to Reading Central Church. Nobody was there. There was only, I think, the head elder. And he, the head elder drove us to the campaign. Didn't want to go in there. Did not want to walk in. Stepped inside and man, I had never felt so self-conscious in my life. I walked in, I got my hood up, everything, sat down, all fucked out, all like, yeah, screw face, all... I mean, I'd had a session the night before, so I looked a mess anyway. And when I walked in, the whole church turned around and, and looked at me. And, man, I'd never felt so self-conscious. I'm the only white guy there. I'm all fogged out. And they look so fresh, they're all suited and just look fresh. And there's me, fogged out. But the pastor that was preaching was at my baptism. How do you work that out? He comes for one week in 2008. And in 2010, he comes back and he's at my baptism. How do you work that out? So I got baptised and when I got baptised, everybody was saying to me, you know, watch out because now Satan's going to be attacking you. Satan will attack you like you've never had it. Like you've had it easy up until now, wait. And I didn't believe them. I was just like, yeah, whatever, you know. What more can you do? Say two months, not even two months. Yeah, about two months. After I got baptized, I mean, my whole life, I suffered with eczema. Always suffered with eczema. In January, it started to get bad and basically what happened I was at my girlfriend's sister's house and I washed my face and whatever was on the towel that I washed my face with I had an allergic reaction to and I had these lumps come up and say within three minutes they started to weep and it was all just dripping down my face and I was thinking what's going on Within half an hour, my whole face was just weeping. My whole face was weeping. I didn't know what was going on. It was just running down. I had my head on a pillow and the pillow was soaking. Uh, went home. Went to sleep with my face still like it. Couldn't stop it. Woke up the next morning and my face is just, my head is double the size. My head had grown double the size. And where my face had been weeping the whole night, it was crusty, it was hard. 
I mean, I couldn't move my mouth. I could only open my eyes a little bit. I couldn't, I didn't eat the whole day. I couldn't move my mouth at all. I didn't know what was going on. I went to the doctor, got some antihistamines and just some things from the doctor. And the next day I woke up and it's gone. It is gone. How did that happen? Within one day, my head went a boom and then it's back down normal and everything's gone. My face, I just had a few red marks on my face. From that day, my eczema became worse than I had ever had it in my life. Worse than ever, ever, ever before. I mean, my whole body from here to the bottom of my foot was just raw. Just, there was not a moment in the day where I wasn't itching. And I was trying so hard to just live for God. Running up to that point, I mean, I was a true Christian. I was a man of the Bible. And then slowly, I would like to say though, in, um, in say January time, actually, actually, it was actually December the 31st, the last time I used any drug or anything that it was bad for me. I quit smoking, I quit smoking weed. Uh, didn't really drink anyway, but I stopped drinking. Um, and I just, I was a man of God. Slowly, I began to get depressed because of how I just felt every day. For two months, every day, I just felt bad. Just, I couldn't move without having to itch. I started to blame God. I really started to blame God. And I, I eventually started to, after three months, I started to, smoke weed again, I, used to, I started smoking cigarettes again, I started to drink again. I was trying to find any other way other than God to numb the pain. And I mean Satan knew how to get me, he really knew how to get me. He knew that at that time cigarettes weren't going to affect me. Weed wasn't going to affect me. He couldn't tempt you with it. So, of course he knew that my life, I've had skin problems. So he used that to get to me. I started using it more and more and more. And eventually I was smoking every day again. I got to the point where I was just severely depressed and just wanted to die. Again, I just wanted to die. Now, Satan he knows how to get to you. He really, really knows how to get to you. He's been doing this for eternity. He knows how to get to you. And in March, or let's, let's just say, no fault of my own, I lost my home through no fault of my own. He took my home away from me, he took everything. 
absolutely everything. And I started to blame God. I was, I mean, there were, people would ask me to worship with them. I would say no, I didn't want nothing to do with God. I, I got to the point where I just, I just hated him. This all happened so quick. And so I was out, out on my own again. I lost my home again. I went to a friend's and that friend helped me. He took me in. I was staying there for around two weeks. And then, I don't know, Satan was just talking to me and controlling me. And for some reason, I just left. I just left. I don't know why, I didn't know where I was going, but I left. I spent a good, say, three weeks, or a month, say, going from place to place, not knowing every day, not knowing where, where I'm going to stay, you know, not having no idea where I'm going to stay. But the thing is, although I, although I kind of, I didn't really want to know God anymore. I still had faith in him. I knew 100% because he had proved it to me. I knew that he would provide for me. Every single night, he provided me somewhere to sleep. Every single night. I was struggling with so many sins. And I knew that I was doing them and I didn't care. Really didn't care. And then... Some friends let me stay at their house for a week. And then the guy that I was staying with, uh, when I first lost my place, he got in contact and he... Um, he, he let me move back in. I was there for around two months. And because of my sins, I was struggling. I was struggling, he couldn't I mean, Satan was using me to attack him. So I was just making it hard for him. Eventually, he asked me to leave. He couldn't deal with it no more. He asked me to leave. And that was probably the best thing that could have happened. The next day, I went to, or that night, sorry, I went to uh, my girlfriend's sister's house and stayed the night there. That day, I had contacted a friend who lives in Slough and they said that I could come and stay with them. And that day, was one of the best days of my life. From that day, I decided to live righteous. I realised, you know, I realised what my sins were doing. How Satan had a grip on me. And I just, 
I asked God to take it away. And from that day, instant, he took it all away. I thank him so much. And now, I've been staying with the friend for about six weeks. And no matter what happens, I know God will provide. I know wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, God will provide. I live there, or I'm staying there, and I've devoted now, redevoted my life to God. And daily, I mean, my day is not just, I don't just have a, a devotion in the morning, a worship in the morning. My day, my whole day is a worship. God has saved me. And I love him for that. This is all I can really say now, to be honest. Just trust in God. You know, Jesus has come to take away our sins. He's come, he died for us. He didn't die for nothing. And we need to de dedicate our lives to telling people what Jesus can do. You know, if Jesus can take me from what I've been through, he can do anything. It's all because of Jesus that I'm here. God kept me alive for a reason. Those times where I said, you know, I'm gonna kill myself today, God told me no, and he told me no because he has a plan. He has a plan for each of us. He's planned for me to spread his gospel, spread what he does for everybody. And I just hope and pray that anybody watching this, they dedicate their life to Christ. They can accept him and know that if they accept him, he will save them. He didn't die for no reason. He died so we could go to heaven. And I love him. Praise God.